I'm delighted to welcome Anne to MSR Redmond. Knew it. <laughs> um, Anne uh, is uh, an assistant professor at the Department of Psychology at Berkeley, uh, and she heads the CCN lab, mm -hmm. Computational Cognitive Neuroscience. Exactly. Did I get the order right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, she's done amazing work. And in speaking to her today morning, I realized that she offers a complementary perspective to what Manuel Blum spoke about just a couple of weeks back on the conscious Turing machines. Well, here is a cognitive scientist who will give us the cognitive science viewpoint on working memory. And I, I, I do remember reading one of your papers uh, a few years back on how much of reinforcement learning in humans is just working memory mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. actual reinforcement learning. I'm very eager to hear more about bringing RL, computation, neural coding together. Great. Looking forward to the talk. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's, uh, it's very exciting for me to be here. I don't get that often a chance to talk to, uh, uh, to people in AI, and I think we could uh, all be benefit more from from our discussion often, so uh, so that's that's really great. Um, so I prepared a talk that has two parts, um, and that is supposed to be a, a, a one hour, but I was told to expect lots of uh, interruptions, which I really welcome. Um, it's always hard to uh, make sure in advance what people know and what don't, so please feel free to ask questions at any time. And uh, I made it so that if we go through the first part, I'll be very happy, <laughs> so, um, so, so that's good. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, so I'm going in my lab. I my lab is called computational cognitive neuroscience, and I uh, really try to take the three angles to try to understand how humans make decisions and um, uh, and learn. And I focus on reinforcement learning, and uh, I'm going to. Uh, very quickly define that because I think it means different things to different um, communities actually. So there's the whole um, AI community who means something, um, AI and more generally applied math and computer science community who means um, something with reinforcement learning. There's the cognitive crowd who looks at behavior and means something else and there's the uh, neuroscience crowd who means something else again. And of course this is all uh, related. Um, but um, it's also different in very important ways that I'm going to try to talk about. <clears throat> okay, so um, I probably don't need to explain this part to you guys, the computation. Uh, the way I think of it, at least from my external point of view, is that it's really a class of learning algorithms that have, are trying to find policies that um, maximize a fairly specific kind of cost function, uh, minimize uh, cost function. And um, you're going to be fairly disappointed in the kind of Reinforcement learning algorithm I use, it's essentially the simplest uh, you can think of, the one where you um, get an estimate of the value, get a reward prediction error, and update your value. So most of my reinforcement learning algorithms are going to be limited to that today. Sorry. <laughs> um, in uh, the psychology, cognition, um, cognitive science field, we think of reinforcement learning as a set of behaviors and also a set of uh, tasks that uh, we use to probe this behavior, um, and that's everything that uh, where essentially we have to learn from uh, feedback that's either reinforcing or punishing is fair game to being called uh, reinforcement learning. Okay, so here I'm giving an example. It's not even human. This is a um, this is a rodent who's learning a, a simple bandit task. Uh, the color here tells us which of two bandits are um, the best at a given time, and you see that the uh, the size of the ticks tells us whether um, the animal um, um, got a reward or not for for this choice. And you see that the animal learns to pick green when green is good and orange when orange is good, etc. <coughs> okay, so this is the kind of reinforcement learning behavior uh, we look at. <coughs> and what's um, interesting here is that. If you uh, plot um, the aggregated uh, behavior, um, so here it's the, the dotted line uh, plotting the, the probability of choosing either of the bandits, um, this can be really captured super well by the simple kind of algorithm we saw before. Um, so uh, this is where um, the algorithms coming from computer science have been um, uh, helpful in, in capturing behavior. So here we have the action value for both of the bandits, and that's capturing uh, this behavior really well. Okay, so because of that, people uh, think of them as related. <coughs> um, the last, um, the last um, third <laughs> of the community um, is neuroscientists. 
And reinforcement learning has a very specific place in, in the heart of neuroscientists because it's been one of the uh, success stories of uh, computational neuroscience in the past uh, 20 years. Um, and that's because we identified um, um, uh, a region of the brain, uh, a region that has neurons that encode dopamine, um, that happened to encode something very, very close to what we think of as a reward prediction error. Is this something you guys know or no? Okay, great, perfect. Um, so this is um, what I'm plotting here are um, each line is uh, the, the firing of a single neuron, and the top is aggregating this over multiple trials of the same type. <clears throat> and what you see here um, is an animal getting a reward, and you see that those dopamine neurons um, uh, increase the spiking. And so they seem to be signaling, oh, uh, something better than I was <coughs> expecting happened here. After a while, uh, the animal learns to predict this reward. So that's, you can think of Pavlov's uh, um, experiment. The bell um, predicts uh, the food. Uh, so that's what CS here means. And when you get that, this is where you get uh, dopamine signaling. Um, so that's a positive reward prediction error. And then when you get the reward, you're expecting it. And there's no um, dopamine signaling again. And then when the animal was expecting a reward but did not get it, there's a, there's a dip in signaling. So this um, set of neurons seem to be encoding something exactly what you would want for a reward prediction error. <coughs> People have gone further, looked at the circuits, seen who um, dopamine neurons talk to. And essentially what they've learned is that there's a really well-defined circuit in the brain that uh, uses um, dopamine um, neurons that have this reward prediction error to modulate plasticity between um, those neurons that encode something like a state and those neurons that um, will help you make a choice downstream that seem to essentially be encoding uh, this equation uh, with the help of dopamine and neurons. Yeah. Um, so I heard from by watching one of the talks from like Lisa Feldman Barrett, who's also like a psychologist, and yeah. she said dopamine is not a reward signal, yeah. but it's actually a chemical that's used to encourage community building. And she said more recent research in neuroscience actually points towards this. So I was wondering what your take on that is. So it definitely doesn't encode reward. You can see it here, right? You can see that when you get a reward here, you get a signal, and you get a reward here, you don't get a signal. Um, and that's before, before you know, those, those sets of papers, people thought of dopamine as encoding reward. After this set of papers, they thought actually it's more reward prediction here uh, than reward. Um, this is a very strongly established um, uh, finding. Um, it's always more complicated than you think. Um, so it's, it's actually not quite as simple as a simple uh, reward prediction here. Um, but uh, community building is not something uh, I, I've heard before, it, it, it encourages learning, it encourages um, associations, um, so it encourages plasticity, so it encourages learning um, to associate something with something else. Um, maybe that's what you meant, I don't know. Yeah, the, then like more of a person question that I have is like, perhaps is this more of a correlation that underlies? Uh... No, no, so, so people have done all the experiments on that, they've try the causality. Um, there's many ways in which um, you can, you know, for example, force dopamine neurons to fire, and then you see an effect on behavior. You can, people have really intervened in all, all, all little places of the circuit. This is, this is a very strong finding. It's, it's more complicated than, 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 than this very simple story, but at, you know, if you think of your Taylor expansion at the first degree, it's right. For sure. <laughs> After that, you know, it might be a bit off. But <laughs> okay, so we have a circuit that's implementing uh, this kind of uh, algorithm, um, at first approximation, and um, and so again, that's a place where people have said, "Whoa, it's amazing!" You know, you can take an algorithm from computer science and, and explain the brain. Um, and so because of that, because of this successful uh, link between uh, those three things, people have tended to. Um, think of reinforcement learning as one thing um, only. Um, and uh, even though the field uh, has actually known all the time that it was not right, that there's, that there's, um, uh, that there's lots of other things that we should think about. So, for example, um, when, when, when you think of, um, of the brain encoding this algorithm, uh, you never say anywhere, um, 
what the state space or what the action space is on, over which uh, this uh, equation operates. Okay? Uh, we don't know that, and it's probable that another uh, brain region, for example, is responsible for that. <coughs> and that this might have very important consequences for how uh, we learn, etc. <coughs> Same, um, this algorithm we have here is optimizing something fairly specific, right? Uh, this expected value of the sum of future discounted uh, rewards. Um, but it's very possible also that part of your behavior is driven by other kind of uh, cost functions or, or benefit functions, in which case we would uh, uh, want to make good use of other kind of algorithms. <coughs> okay, so that's why I try to understand is if we want to understand human learning or animal learning for that matter, um, we need to think of um, those other pieces, both in the brain and in computation. And so what I want to try to do uh, today uh, is to um, give you um, two examples uh, of this. One is on transfer generalization, and the other one is on. Uh, uh, how two different systems contribute to uh, the behavior of learning in humans, uh, focusing on working memory. And I'm actually going to start with the second one because I think you uh, will be very interested in um, this one, especially given uh, what I did told me of uh, your previous talk. Um, and uh, if we have time, we can talk about the other one. But um, it's okay if we just uh, do the first one, the second one, I guess. <coughs> okay, so. Um, let me introduce this. Um, the circuit we've talked about earlier that implements reinforcement learning system um, is, is, is a very well understood um, um, memory and learning system in the brain. So here you have a brain cut like this. Um, uh, you have the cortex in green and then you have elements um, under the cortex, deeper in the, in the brain, that are the parts that are crucial for doing this uh, reinforcement learning computation. <coughs> Okay, so this is one, one, one system, one network that we know works well for doing reinforcement learning. <coughs> However, the psychologists have known for you know, a very, very long time that we have other uh, memory systems. For example, we have um, episodic memory that's encoded in this different structure, the hippocampus. Episodic memory, people give the example usually of, um, it's, it's the kind of memory you use to remember where you parked uh, uh, this morning. Um, you can know it very precisely. It doesn't have to interfere with what you parked yesterday, uh, but then when you don't need it, you probably won't remember it anymore. Okay. <clears throat> and then there's a, uh, another memory system, working memory. So apparently uh, you guys heard about this last week or two weeks ago. Um, and working memory is slightly different. It's this uh, system where you um, actively uh, try to remember something. And you can do that for only a very little amount of information for a very um, short amount of time. And um, it's going to be very subject to interference. Okay, so that's the classic example here is the um, phone number that you have to actively remember until you use it and then it disappears uh, very quickly from your memory. <coughs> <coughs> okay, so we have those three systems. Um, and the first major question is we have three memory systems um, and we only make a single decision at a given time. Um, and so we have to understand how they work together um, when we're learning uh, to figure out, uh, to, to, um, uh, to make us uh, make choices. <coughs> okay, so this first system um, is, uh, you can think of it maybe um, as the deep reinforcement learning um, systems that uh, have taken over um, AI uh, RL uh, recently, uh, they, they seem to be doing very analogous uh, computations. Um, Long-term memory or episodic memory has also recently made um, a bit of a foray into, um, into, um, uh, into the AI uh, reinforcement learning um, Domain. So uh, here I'm just citing two papers, but I know you guys also have uh, uh, your um, your own research that includes this. Um, but uh, I have not seen um, any evidence uh, that the AI community is thinking much about what working memory is contributing uh, to learning. So I love to be contradicted, by the way. You could certainly say that LSTMs are an example of working memory. They have infinite capacity. They have essentially infinite capacity, right? 
So in that sense, they're very not working memory. Well, in practice, though, it's, it's far smaller than uh, infinite. It's just uh, a few tens of time steps, practically uh -huh. speaking. Right, right. Um, so yeah, so I, I thought of Elastium has this aspect of active maintenance, in a sense, and integration. Um, I think there are a few crucial differences with working memory. So working memory, we think of it as being able to maintain very precisely one piece of information on its own, or a few pieces of information, which I think is fairly distinct, in a sense, of what LSTMs are doing in integrating everything in a space that we're not completely sure exactly what information it has in the end, right? Um, I think there is something that's been demonstrated that LSTMs cannot do, and that is store novel associations and mm -hmm. maintain those for a certain period of time in a flexible way. Yeah. They only store the types of th information that have been trained over uh, mm -hmm. uh, hundreds of thousands of time steps. Yeah. Right, right. And also, we think of working memory as something where we can, that, that's an internal representation over which we can operate. Um, so, for example, I might give you a number and another number and make you remember them and after that ask you give me the product of them, in which case you would have to operate over them and so manipulate those, those representations. Yeah. So networks that have uh, explicit external memory stores that they access by a process that is mis mislabeled attention, Yeah. Um, uh, is that not uh, a case of working memory? Of course it doesn't. It's not intended to have limitations of working memory, yeah. but it is something that maintains only what's actively uh, being operated on. Yeah, yeah. So I think it might be related um, in a sense. Um, I think you're right. Um, a question I have um, so far is, for some reason, we have this limitation, and it could be, a, you know, a, a true limitation, or it could be something useful. Um, to uh, to human cognition, and and if it is, um, uh, I, I haven't seen this built into um, <coughs> into AI. But but you know if if you if you know um, of that, okay. yeah. Point, the yeah. attention models, uh, but but also the previous talk about working memory, they all have this uh, feel of actually doing the reasoning, doing uh -huh. explaining away, which yeah. is what neural networks don't do. Yeah. Um, like attention is you try to go somewhere and read it, and then. Yeah go forward and go back yeah. immediately and so on. So you have, you could have mecha uh, mechanisms that go in circles like this and the working memory uh, paper, uh, talk we heard from uh, Professor Blum was like that too, that you keep on going back and forth. Mm -hmm. And the limitation is, I guess, there to promote reasoning mm -hmm. rather than, than um, sort of, uh, you know, uh, sixth sense kind of guessing, right? Potentially, yeah. I obviously haven't seen this talk, so I can't. Uh, I can't really relate that well to it. But um, yeah. So, uh, thinking of just the, the subcortical circuits, yeah. like um, in in deep RL, there is also this push on more model-based RL approaches. Mm -hmm. I'm curious where there might be an analog to that in this picture. Um, would you mind getting back to this question at the end? Because I feel like, um, so relating the work I'm doing to the mall based mall free framework is something that is actually a, you know, a, a nearly 99% confidence this question will come up in my, in my talk. And I feel like it's always better um, explained afterwards than before. But if you want to come back to it before that, I'll, I'll be happy to. Uh, yeah. So, is there a role for long-term memory in any of this? In in uh, oh, um, I'm lumping episodic memory and long-term memory uh, in one. Uh, okay, now. so yeah. long. Yeah, the that, that's understanding that McClellan style two systems of cortical memory versus hippocampal memory. So, so long-term memory um, is is it tends to be fairly vague term, right? Episodic memory can be long-term, and reinforcement learning can also create those kind of uh, long-term associations that can go from being subcortical to being cortical, as, as I know you know. Um, and, so, um, and so I think of both of those as being long-term, uh, contributing at least to the creation of long-term memories, whereas this one is very short-term. Um, uh, 
people who study memory will divide memory into fairly different ways. So again, this is an approximation um, uh, not to be taken on us uh, face value. Okay, so the one I'm focusing on right now is working memory um, and how it plays a role in learning. Um, people haven't actually looked at that too much in, uh, in human learning. Um, okay, so I've, I've, given, you know, I've given you the intuition already, but I'm, I'm going to make it a bit more precise. So uh, if you remember when you were learning how to drive, you're given lots of uh, instructions that you, um, if you're a careful student, will try to um, actively keep in mind at the beginning. So for example, the speed limit, um, remembering to signal when turning, uh, remembering more abstract things like the rules for how to handle a four-way stop or a red light in the U.S. Um, and also even more abstract things like how to not kill a um, bicyclist. Okay? Um, <coughs> and, then, and then, so you'll try to actually very actively remember this. Okay? So uh, you'll keep this in your mind. So like, okay, I need to not go faster than 25. And what, <coughs> at the beginning, what will invariably happen is that you'll forget some of those. Um, and hopefully the worst thing that will happen is that you'll get a ticket for speeding or something like that, okay? Um, so that's, that this is illustrating two ways in which you're learning, uh, right? You're, you're actively maintaining information and trying to apply it, that's working memory, and then you're also um, getting feedback when you mess up or encouragement if you do, you're doing well, and that's reinforcement learning, okay? And so... I think of them as uh, as being at two uh, different ends of um, of, uh, of a trade off. Um, one um, learning um, incremental and in integrated information in in the sense of the value or the policy um, that we're trying to apply, and so in that sense it's inflexible. Um, but the positive for this is that it's um, um, of very broad capacity. You can learn lots of things with reinforcement learning. It's robust in the long term and it's um, fairly effortless. Um, in the other direction, working memory um, is one-shot kind of learning, very fast. Um, it stores information very precisely, and it's uh, flexible. We can operate over our operations in working memory, over our information. Um, and the downside is that it's resource or capacity <coughs> limited. Um, amount of information you can hold is limited. It's, it's limited in time, too, and it's effortful. Um, is something that we have to uh, engage uh, cognitive attention um, into. Okay, so what I wanted to do is try to develop um, an experimental protocol that would help me um, show that those work together uh, during learning and develop computational models that will also um, uh, capture this. Okay, so I'll explain my experimental protocol now. It's actually uh, quite simple. Um, so if you're a participant in this experiment, you would see an item on a computer screen, for example, a pumpkin. Actually, it's a perfect season for us. <laughs> um, and then you would make a choice uh, by pressing a key with one of, uh, one of three keys uh, on a keyboard. And then you would get feedback that would tell you if you pick the correct key for this image. And then you would see another item. Um, and you would repeat this process. Um, you would repeat it uh, for a number of trials in the block. For example, you would see the pumpkin and the green beans uh, 15 times each. Um, and uh, over time, you would just be using this feedback information here to, uh, to learn to pick the correct uh, action for each item. There's one correct action for each item? Yeah, there's one correct action. Uh, um, there's only one correct action per item. Uh, a correct action can be correct for more than one item. Uh, the feedback is deterministic, uh, so if you have a perfect memory, uh, you try this, you try that, you try that, you're done. Okay, and then and then you're perfect. Yeah. <coughs> How many different images for people see? Perfect question. Um, so in some blocks, people will see two images like this, um, and um, in other blocks we will see three, four, five, up to six images, okay? And that's actually the critical uh, manipulation because by, um, by having a classic reinforcement learning experiment where I'm giving feedback uh, in response to people's choices, I test the reinforcement learning part of, uh, of learning. So I see how much the, um, the history of feedback influences choices. But by manipulating um, this, what I call the set size, the number of images that people learn about, I manipulate um, the load on working memory. And what is really well known about working memory is that uh, it's 
can't uh, maintain uh, that much information. So this uh, should affect um, differently this block compared to this block. <coughs> Does that make sense? I'd like to make sure we're good here because, yeah. Uh, maybe I missed something. Yeah. Does the user answer after each image or yeah. after a potentially long series of images? No, it, uh, the, the user answers each time. Yeah. After so, each image? Yeah, yeah. And maybe you're uh, going to tell us next what the what the criterion is that the user uses to choose which button. What's, what are they supposed to? So at the beginning, they're going to pick randomly because they have no information. Okay. They're, okay. they're abandoned. Yeah. The exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 essentially a bandit. Yeah. So a contextual three arm bandit. Yeah. Uh, does the user know that there's only one correct action? Yes. Uh, we, the the instructions are uh, explicit uh, that the feedback is truthful, deterministic, that there's only one correct action that it won't change in the block, um, and that uh, information about one stimulus is not informative for the other stimuli. If that's the case and we get lucky with the color the first trial, mm -hmm. then perhaps that user is, should not be equally evaluated against someone who had to explore a bit more. Yeah, so that's why I do this many different blocks. Okay. That way, in average, um, you should start at chains. Yeah, uh, that's go always going to be uh, noise, of course, there. Yeah. Yeah. Are they told ahead of time that the assignments are random? images, or do they start assuming that there is some logic to the, to the game? So humans will always assume there's logic or structure, even if they're tell told them there, isn't? <laughs> there isn't. Yeah, I tell them, I tell them that um, they can't infer. For example, what happens often is in, when they're in a block with three images, people want to think that there's a one-to-one -one mapping between images and, and actions, and I tell them that explicitly is not the case, that they can't, um, that they can't um, infer the third one. Also, yeah. They shouldn't assume that the left button is for vegetables and the right button is for landscapes. They shouldn't assume that. No. Because if they do start looking for logic, then yeah. that's going to affect the whole experiment later because they will be using totally different apparatus than we're talking about here. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, that would correct itself from feedback. But I have, um, you know, I've taken lots of care to try to minimize this kind of biases. So, for example, uh, we, we try to make sure that the images in the set are of the same category and have no uh, visual structure that will let them clump together. It's, it's completely impossible to completely get rid of this kind of um, you know, reasoning. That's actually the second part of my talk is people search for structure. Make sure there is no obvious bustling structure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any more questions? <clears throat> Okay, so if you take my vanilla super simple reinforcement learning model and apply it to this task, um, so this one where you have reward prediction errors that you use to update the value of uh, the stimulus and the key, um, the, it's making uh, a prediction in this experiment that because you're learning for one stimulus completely independently of the other stimuli, um, um, there is not going to be any effect of set size. So if you plot, um, if you simulate this model and this experiment with uh, parameters that I didn't put here, um, but they're, 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 they fit to the, uh, to the subjects, uh, and if you plot here uh, the performance of the model, so the probability that it's choosing the correct action as a function of, so this isn't time, this is how many times you've seen a given item. Okay. It's making the prediction that the set size doesn't matter. Is that clear? <coughs> right? Because it's just, it's just uh, storing the Q value for image for the pumpkin completely independently of, of, of the green base. <coughs> okay, this is an obvious terrible prediction. Um, when you look at uh, participants, this is what it looks like. People start to arrange chains, so like one third. And when they have to learn two things, they're fairly close to optimal. They take three tries and then they get rich their asymptotic behavior. And then the bigger um, the um, uh, set size, the more incremental their overall uh, learning curve uh, looks like. Okay, <clears throat> So this is an effect that can't be uh, accounted for um, by the classic form of reinforcement learning that people usually use. And then you can do all kinds of tricks on this, um, on this uh, reinforcement learning model. So for example, you can add forgetting, or you can add interference, or you can add um, uh, 
many different mechanisms and try to see if you can still force a single reinforcement learning model to capture the behavior. And I have not been successful. So this is about the best you can do. If you just add some forgetting to the Q values at each trial, uh, you're going to get a slight effect of set size due to the fact that when you're learning two things, you see them every two trials in average, whereas when you're learning six things, you see them every six trials in average. So you have more time to forget. Okay, uh, but it's clearly not capturing the qualitative pattern of behavior. Yeah. So on the right graph yeah. that shows with two stimuli, the blue curve, yeah. the fast learning shown there, yeah. is that because of generalization between images of two things? No, no. So this is the pattern you expect with perfect memory. Um, so this is the first time you see the pumpkin second time you see the pumpkin, third time you see the pumpkin. Because you have three keys, this is the optimal pattern um, to have. So if you have perfect memory, you'll remember I try this, I try that, I try that, and this is the correct, um, the correct one. And so why does perfect memory do better with two stimuli than with six? Well, these are humans. So what I think this is showing is that when we're trying to remember two things, this is still within our working memory capacity, which is able then to uh, use it perfectly. So perfectly remember, okay, this one for the pumpkin and this one for the green beans. But as soon as we go a bit beyond that, it goes beyond our working memory capacity. So we can't have that perfect memory. So that's what's being illustrated as yeah. the problem mm -hmm. working yeah. So the reinforcement learning, is it just that because alpha is not big enough, it takes longer? Absolutely, yeah. You could have an alpha that's bigger and a, and a softmax in the temperature that's bigger, and you could have perfect uh, like the, the parameters I used here are the best fit parameters uh, to this behavior. I don't remember exactly what it is. Sorry. Yeah. <coughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Does that mean that reinforcement learning is actually better than like human memory? Um, that's going to be very dependent on the environment. Um, and I'm going to speak a bit about that later. Um, uh, but, but probably not. Probably not. Because, uh, because if it was, then uh, you would expect that when you're within your capacity, you would be doing worse than, than, than when, when you're outside, when you're using reinforcement um, It seems like for most of the cases, I, I at least above that like four, yeah. Oh, sorry, this is, I see what you mean. You're, you're plotting this compared to this. Yeah. Um, this is, again, fit um, with parameters fit to this, right? And so, the, again, I could make this model better or worse. Um, you know, I could put the decay to zero and, and the learning rate to one, and then it would be learning perfectly, uh, for example. Um, so, so there's no real point in comparing. The point of comparing those two is to say the qualitative pattern, the, spray, the, the spread, um, the way behavior changes with set size is much more marked in humans than it is in the best fitting uh, reinforcement learning model that you can have. Does that make sense? Thank you. <coughs> okay, so the idea uh, here is that uh, what I think I'm showing is that I can't explain the behavior of learning in this task with a simple, uh, b with only a module that has reinforcement learning, I have to account uh, also for working memory. <coughs> okay, so to do that, um, I uh, developed a model that has a module, an expert, that's uh, reinforcement learning, the, the same as before. And then that also has a working memory uh, module um, that I'll talk about later. And then I assume that learning or the policy that participants end up taking is uh, a mixture uh, of the policies of the two experts. Okay, so it's this idea that we have those two learning system, uh, decision systems, and that they're going to um, uh, mix, um, come together for, for a choice. Okay, so the way I model the working memory uh, comes from what we know about uh, working memory outside of the domain of learning, in the domain of uh, decision making. Yeah. Uh, is that second, uh, the RL box, yeah. um, the same as what you were describing a moment ago? Yeah. So that it, it gives uh, better behavior than humans exhibit uh, in some sense. Uh, it doesn't show this, the effect of, of set size uh, as dramatically. Exactly. Uh, 
so, so, so it would be, it, it's, it's very even simpler. It's this, this one. Oh, OK. Yeah. Um, OK. The, the assumption is that the, the reinforcement, the pure reinforcement learning literature hasn't shown any effect of, of decay. So I think, I think um, the, the forgetting is a, is a property of working memory rather than reinforcement learning. OK, so what the working memory is doing um, is I, I'm going to assume that we have a fixed number of items we can maintain of in working memory. Uh, so for example, three, and I'm going to parameterize that by a capacity parameter. Um, and what this is, the way I'm going to model this is to say, well, uh, three out of, uh, out of the number of items I'm trying to remember are going to be stored perfectly in working memory, and the other three are not going to be stored. And uh, I can't do exactly that for technical reasons. So instead, what I um, do is um, imagine that working memory has a perfect policy, uh, one trial back, but uh, decay over time. And then that the probability that I will be able to use this item uh, for my decision is going to decay um, with um, a set size uh, when it goes below capacity. OK, so it's at, it's at it's at its maximum uh, if the number of items I'm trying to remember is below capacity, and then it, it decreases in an inverse um, way um, over. So you just said that the working memory represents a policy. And does that mean that when we see an image there yeah. in a rectangle on the left, yeah. and one of the three yeah. choices is highlighted, that that's the correct choice, or mm -hmm. it's the choice that the user chose? Um, so that would be. Um, uh, it's the last trial's information. Which may be wrong. Which may be wrong. Well, it, it, it won't be wrong because the feedback is deterministic, but it will remember um, uh, 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 to not pick something that was wrong. So it's not the yeah. optimal policy. Mm -hmm. It's just some information of what they did. And also, yeah. I, I guess it's implied that it remembers yeah. whether they were rewarded or not for that case. Yeah, so, so it's, it's joining um, it's, it's, it's joining a bit all of this, actually. So if I can go into a bit more detail about how I model it. it essentially, I'm modeling the working memory um, uh, the, the same way as I do the, um, the, the reinforcement learning model with a learning rate of 1. So it has this uh, um, uh, compressed information. Uh, but it also has this decay, which means that the policy gets worse uh, the more intervening uh, trials um, uh, come in. Okay. And then, and then the, um, this um, tells me how likely I am to use working memory versus reinforcement learning, and it decreases with set size. <coughs> and uh, this is going to go into the mixture weight here, telling me how likely I am to use working memory versus um, versus error. <coughs> OK, so this, this model has a few uh, uh, free parameters that I can fit, again, to participants' behavior. And then when I have uh, fit those parameters, I can simulate the model again and uh, compare to participants. And you see that, essentially, we capture um, the behavior uh, much better than we did with the previous uh, reinforcement learning uh, models. OK, so uh, this is just one uh, step of showing that this model is helpful for um, understanding um, uh, understanding human learning, and I've, I've done many others to validate the fact that we really need those two modules to um, um, to to, to, um, to explain human learning. But I won't bore you with the details. Yeah. Um, the natural thing for me to do as a next step would be to vary another parameter and vary the reward that somebody gets for mm -hmm. being successful. Yeah. Um, is that? But I know that in psychology, experiments aren't often rewarded. Yeah. Have you run that experiment? Uh, so I've run a version of this experiment. Uh, I actually don't think I'll be talking about this. Yeah, I've, I've run a version of this experiment where we do manipulate um, um, the reward we get for being correct. So we, we still have zero versus deterministic information um, as to whether the output is correct. And then we vary one point versus two points um, probabilistically. Um, and... Uh, it's a mixed success because it's very hard to make people actually care <laughs> about reward, especially in such a long, um, participants here do 900 trials. Um, so any single 
point they get at a single trial does not have very much influence. So we end up seeing that people are not paying that much attention to it. Um, so we should, we should probably work harder to try to incentivize those points more um, if, if, we, if we want <coughs> to go there. But I haven't done too much more there. Yeah. Sense to uh, play with the order of images now to, to show that this this really does happen not only on average like this but in, if you keep on sending the same images then they perform perfectly and then there is a drop in performance and so on because you can you can actually uh, predict more complicated things through time yeah. based on this model. Yeah. So I think my model for key memory so far is pretty bad actually. I think it's it's an average model and and it's something I'm working on. Um, it's been very difficult to find um, a better prediction of... So, so what's difficult for me right now is um, to say, I have a capacity of three, um, and I'm trying to remember six things. Um, which three am I going to prioritize? Um, and there's no very good information out there telling me um, uh, how this is happening. And this is something I can try to look at here, but uh, it's been actually extremely difficult to find any pattern in the way uh, participants are doing that. But even just reporting participants, how they behave, if they keep on getting the same yeah. three images for a while, and yeah. then the fourth, and then the same three for a while, uh -huh. and then the fifth, and different, different ways of showing them information and see how long it takes them to learn. Mm -hmm. Because then you've got very different temporal behaviors, yeah. and then even using the model that you already have, yeah. you can see whether it fits better. Yeah, the problem is that, um, this is, so these are all experiments we've um, thought of doing. Um, th there's many difficulties. Some of them are that we assume that actually uh, the weight we give to working memory, so uh, I glossed over this, uh, but you see that the maximum here is not one. Um, it's actually a, a parameter two. And, um, uh, and we actually think that people... Um, don't have a fixed um, mixture uh, weight, even for a given policy here. That over time they might say, like as reinforcement learning becomes better at predicting, uh, you know, reinforcement learning is going to learn slower, but over, after some time it's going, going to have learned well and not be sensitive to uh, decay, uh, which means it's going to become a better predictor over time, at which point, because working memory is effortful, we might uh, start choosing it less, even if we can. Uh, so there are very complicated dynamics in time actually happening there, um, which is why uh, <laughs> it, it's more complicated than it looks like to actually understand well um, uh, what working memory is doing. Yeah. Have you looked at, just with this existing data, yeah. how the probability of being correct varies with the amount of time since they've seen that particular image? Absolutely, yeah. Um, it's in the paper, I didn't put it in this presentation, but there's a big effect of delay that interacts both with time and with set size. So the effect of delay is bigger in higher set sizes, so uh, there's more forgetting, um, and um, it uh, disappears over time, which I think we, we think of as a marker of people stopping using working memory and starting using RL instead. Yeah. So it seems like we're assuming that people are exploring randomly if they haven't seen an image before? Yeah, that's the baseline assumption, yeah. Do, do we know if people are doing, or so, so one alternative way that I could see someone trying to approach a problem mm -hmm. like this, which might make it easier to remember what you've done in the mm -hmm. past, would be to basically systematically explore. So yeah. rather than actually choosing randomly, yeah. you could just say, if I haven't seen it before, I hit key one. I've seen it before. I hit key two, yeah. and then I know. I know after two cycles. I'm yeah. So people definitely do that. There's actually a great paper by someone in Germany um, that's actually not published yet, but on BioArchive, um, who was looking a bit more precisely at this kind of uh, systematic exploration. Um, that's that's definitely happening. Um, I'm not modeling it here for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that there's massive individual differences there, and so you have to end up like saying like, a quarter of my participants do this left to right, and a quarter do this right to left sweep, and um, um, and so it probably accounts for some of the variance, but it probably does not uh, modify the, the, the key uh, finding of interest, which is that working memory, um, the, the load affects um, um, the learning, which is why 
But that's something we have to get used to when we uh, model human learning is that there's always going to be more to it and your model is never going to be good. Um, and so you have to focus on, on specific aspects and think of this kind of confounds and whether or not uh, they would influence or not your finding. And this is the kind of thing I think which is very interesting but won't really have uh, downstream effects on the conclusions I draw. Yeah, because I was just curious if that would have any impact on either the working, the efficiency of the working memory because it seems like you can kind of consolidate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's possible. Things like that. Yeah, so it might make working memory a bit less efficient. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so one way we can um, try to confirm that this is uh, real and related to the brain is to uh, uh, to go look at neural signal. Uh, so this is me wearing an EEG cap. Um, do you guys know um, about EEG at all? Okay, great. Uh, so I can give you the two-line summary. Um, EEG, uh, it's those electrodes that are on the scalp. Um, it's completely painless, perfectly super safe. Um, it just measures uh, electrical activity on the scalp that is generated by, um, by um, uh, activity inside the brain. Um, EEG is great for uh, being super precise in time, so you can resolve things at the, at the millisecond precision. Uh, it's terrible um, to know where things are happening, so you should just not conclude anything about uh, location in the brain uh, based on that. Uh, but it tells us if the neural signal is sensitive to a given signal and when, and that can be very informative already about what computations are happening in the brain. Okay, It's a tiny signal, uh, the signal-to-noise ratio is terrible, which is why we, we need lots of trials. And you end up get getting something that looks like this. Um, so the time zero is your event of interest, for example, the presentation of a stimulus here. And then you get a squiggly line that uh, represents the change in voltage uh, uh, as a response um, to the stimulus. And this is uh, seconds. So you see that things are happening at 100, 200, 300 milliseconds. Reaction times are somewhere around here. Okay, when, when people make their reaction. So we can look at what's happening in the decision process uh, before the decision. <coughs> okay, I can look at this. Um, so this is average over, uh, I don't know, 450 trials or something like that. You can look at every single trial um, here. So this is the same thing, just color-coded the voltage. Each line is a trial, um, and the x-axis is time again. Okay, and when you see it this way, you see that um, there is signal, right? You see this uh, dip here and this uh, peak here. Um, that's fairly repeated, and we think that this uh, corresponds to important uh, computations in the brain. Okay, but there's also lots of noise, obviously. Okay, so I can take this um, signal. I have this is uh, uh, fairly big data. This is a single electrode uh, here. Um, I have this for 64 different electrodes over the brain. And I can try to say, well, um, when I look at the signal, is there anywhere in the signal that is related to my two uh, experts, my reinforcement learning expert and my working memory expert? Okay, so to do that, I can extract from the model components um, that relate to the computations. So for example, the Q values are the reward predictioners of the reinforcement learning signal. And for working memory, I can just look at the set size, for example, because that's something that should matter for working memory. <coughs> Okay. So I can, I can take those variables for each trial, and I can just try to can just do multiple regressions, essentially, so try to explain the uh, voltage uh, across all trials for a given time point and electrode as a function of uh, those uh, predictors that I know matter. Does that make sense? Okay. <coughs> and so when I do that, I end up with a regression weight that tells me um, how well uh, a, different, a given regressor explains the signal at a time and a point of interest, and then try to see how consistent this is across participants, um, across time and electrodes. <coughs> okay, so that's the method. Um, and um, so what I'm going to plot here is the results. So from the time of the stimulus to the time of the choice here, and focusing either on the reinforcement learning process or the working memory process. So when I do that, around 300 milliseconds, I find a number of electrodes here um, that are sensitive to the reinforcement learning process, specifically here the, the Q value predicted by the reinforcement learning process, and uh, no, nowhere in the brain uh, sensitive to, um, to work memory process. Okay? 
If I look a bit later in time, at 500 milliseconds, I find the reverse. I find lots of uh, electrodes sensitive to that size, also putatively the working memory process, and none to the reinforcement learning process. Okay, so that's a way of showing that I've kind of isolated those two um, processes. It matches what we know about the brain, that um, reinforcement learning um, uh, kind of decisions are easy and fast, uh, very, very, very automated in a sense, whereas this is more effortful, it takes more time for the brain to do the computation and actually apply it. Okay? So it kind of validates in a way uh, what I've extracted from the behavior through the model uh, relates to the brain. Does that make sense? <coughs> okay, so it shows that we can retrieve those two processes and that they're distinct. But then I can, um, right. Um, so then I can make use of this to try to understand a bit better what computations are happening under the hood. <coughs> so um, that, that, that would be, um, um, uh, yeah, so, so I'm going to show you how we do that. Uh, so before that, I, I'd like to remind you that I think we've seen two processes here that are really at different ends of, um, of a trade-off. The working memory is optimized for storing information very precisely, very quickly, but not in the long term. Whereas RL is optimized for um, storing lots of things in the long run, but that takes more time um, for it uh, to get there. Okay? Um, and so the, the next question I had in this line of research was to ask what the, what the interaction might be. So first, how they would um, uh, decide, you know, how they would uh, compete for, for choice, in a sense. But even more importantly, um, um, how independent uh, those two processes are. Um, and usually when we think of having two processes that are experts at different ends of a trade-off, we want them to be as independent as possible so that uh, they can um, do their own job well and then uh, be used uh, whenever it's more useful for them to be used. <coughs> um, so I tried to see if that was the case um, or if there was any interaction between them. And to do that, I'm going to focus again on those signals. So here, this is an average signal. Um, this is just saying that um, the, um, uh, the signal in the brain is correlated with the activity of the predicted by the reinforcement learning model in this task. <coughs> um, and I can do the same thing when uh, the participants get uh, feedback and I find an area of the brain, uh, I shouldn't say that, I, I find some signals in the brain that are related um, to the reward prediction error at feedback. Okay, so I'm going to take those signals and I'm going to look at them a bit more carefully and see how they evolve as a function of, um, of learning. And again, if reinforcement learning and working memory are independent, then those signals that I think relate to reinforcement learning should also be independent of working memory processes. And in particular, they should be independent of set size. Okay, so if this is really representing uh, the reinforcement learning system's Q value, then uh, it should look something like this, right? It should look like something that goes up with, uh, with uh, past rewards um, and independently of set size. And for reward prediction error, it should be the opposite, go down uh, with uh, past rewards and then, and then um, and be dependent of set size. Does that make sense, the premise here? Okay, so I can look at that. I can just extract the signal um, at each trial and then uh, replot it uh, differently. Um, so what I'm plotting here is, uh, is a neural learning curve in a sense. So it's the signal that is related, um, that, that is in this region that's uh, sensitive to uh, reinforcement learning processes. I'm plotting it as a function of um, how many previous rewards uh, the participant has experienced for the current image so far. And what you see is that this goes up. That's what you expect of a Q value. So that's the way I selected the signal. So that's normal that we see this. But what you see is that it goes up more slowly for the lower set sizes, for the easiest learning uh, problem, uh, than for the harder one. Okay? So that could be thought of as a bit weird. Um, <coughs> essentially, what this is showing is that, um, <coughs> uh, sorry, it's not drops, it increases. Um, uh, sorry, this, this line is wrong. So the EEG Q value signal uh, increases slower for low set sizes than for high set sizes. So the way we could interpret this is that somehow in low set sizes, we're using working memory <coughs> uh, for learning. We, we can uh, because it's within capacity. Um, and maybe somehow this is blocking the reinforcement learning 
Um, okay, this is what would happen if you had a lower learning rate or something like that. <coughs> okay, but then I looked at uh, the same thing at the time of feedback, the reward prediction error. And if we're imagining that we're blocking the reinforcement learning um, signal, then the reward prediction error should remain high, right? Uh, because you're not learning. Instead, what we're seeing is that the reward prediction errors do drop, the, the signals in the brain that code reward prediction errors do drop with an experience of reward, but they drop faster uh, for, um, for um, low set sizes than for high set sizes. Okay, so it can't be that uh, where key memory is blocking RL, otherwise we would expect the opposite. We would expect those uh, purple line here to be over the orange line. <coughs> Instead, what it looks like here is that um, this is uh, dropping faster um, for the things that are being learned faster. Okay, So it looks like, actually, working memory um, knows what the outcome should be and seems to be contributing to the computation of this uh, reward prediction error, saying like, ah, I picked this action for the pumpkin, I know I'm going to get rewarded. Okay? Yeah? But it's not just that it drops faster, it's that for uh, five and six uh, images, it's, all, it's everywhere higher too, right? It's not just, it's not that everything has the same mean at time at the first observation. Uh, this is actually uh, not different. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a good point. <clears throat> okay, and we can we actually have a much more precise statistical um, uh, evidence for this that I, I haven't shown here, but um, yeah. Okay, so um, so instead of thinking of reinforcement learning as this closed loop uh, system that does its own reward prediction error, uh, this makes us think of working memory as contributing to this reward prediction error. Uh, but it's funny, right? Because, because working memory is learning faster, it's actually going to mess up with the reward prediction error and make RL learn slower. So, yeah? So not on that uh, figure there. So do we independently know that uh, we would expect higher activity as measured here for um, more learning rather than lower? No, we would expect the same. Here, because you here, yeah, because reward history is equated. So if reinforcement mm -hmm. learning did not care about set size, we should expect no interaction of set size with um, reward history. Well, I was just re referring to the fact that you said it was the opposite difference than you might have expected. So that you might have expected if um, with various more cognitive accounts, like, mm -hmm. oh, people are paying more attention, or it's easier, or it's something like that. Um, I mean, easier could correspond to lower signal rather than, right? Yeah, um, right, yeah. So, which is why we want to um, see if this, um, which is why we wanted to see if this was actually related to behavior. Uh, so this makes a very clear prediction, which is that if, if the reinforcement learning signal is being blunted when um, working memory uh, is um, being used, Essentially, it means that the Q values you're, you're learning are going to be weaker uh, than they, they would be otherwise. And the way we can test that is to do the same experiment as, as before. So this is relate, showing the same experiment as before, um, where we expect better performance for low than high set size. But then we can, after that, um, at the end of the experiment, give a surprise test phase where you tell people, oh, now you're going to go back through every image you've seen, every all 80 images you've seen, and you're going to have to pick the correct choice, and I'm not going to give you any feedback. Okay? And that's a way to see what is remaining of their policy that they've learned uh, previously. And it can't be working memory anymore because it's way beyond uh, capacity and, and time range of working memory. And so in a way, that way we can probe what's remaining in the reinforcement learning system, the policy. And what this predicts uh, is that you should have, um, the reinforcement learning system will have learned uh, worse in low set size. And so that we will actually remember less well what we've um, performed on better before than vice versa, which is not at all a prediction that people uh, would normally make. <coughs> okay, so when I did this experiment, um, I got what I was expecting in, um, uh, in learning. So this is proportion of correct trials for size 3 or size 6 at the end of learning. 
And here I'm plotting the difference uh, between, let's say, 3 and 6. So this is positive. It's just the same as before. And then when you do uh, a testing, you get this reversal, this nice interaction where set size 6 performance is actually better um, than set size 3. Okay, so it completely flips. Okay, so somehow working memory has um, had this influence where it's made you, it's easier for you to learn um, a few things at the beginning, but it's made you learn it less well in the long term. <laughs> okay, so this seems, this and various other aspects of the neural computation that I haven't all I've shown you makes us think that this is what's happening. Instead of RL computations happening in closed loop, the working memory system is um, contributing this expectation to the reward prediction error, and in that sense, messing up where the computations of value that are happening um, in the reinforcement learning system. That makes sense? <clears throat> okay, so um, this is... Uh, where I'm at now, and the experiments I'm running now in my lab are trying to understand uh, why we would do that, <laughs> why this would be happening. It's a bit, it's really a bit confusing when you think about it, because um, um, the goal of the reinforcement learning system is to encode something strongly in the long term, okay? And so, and it's thought of being effortless and happening in the background, and um, by by having this. Um, this interference here, you're essentially preventing reinforcement learning of being able to do its job, right? Of being able to do its job of letting you remember well uh, later on. Yeah. So I actually, I'm not sure that it says exactly that. I would think that in this particular example, that's mm -hmm. what it provides evidence mm -hmm. of. But it's yeah. unclear that, you know, that didn't, were the subjects told that, look, you're going to be mm -hmm. tested on this mm -hmm. ex post mm -hmm. and you will be giving no feedback and that there's some you know goal of you memorizing that, mm -hmm. and so if I'm just optimizing for a system in the short run, mm -hmm. we've seen that it's actually optimal potentially to be using my my working memory yeah. in order to optimize this task. Yeah. And so to have us and to subsequently then have a different task. Yeah. It seems like you're moving the goalposts a little bit. <laughs> I am. Yeah. Uh, but the question is, if I'm going to bother running RL mm -hmm. in the background, why should I run it in a way? Uh, that's suboptimal. If if I'm going to yeah. be, because it, it in the short run, it would be better to have error running um, the normal way, because it would make you uh, learn faster wherever your working memory fails. And in long term, it would be in this experiment, it would be better to also have let error learn uh, its own way, because then you would be able to remember uh, better. So within this experiment. Um, even if I told participants, uh, it would in any case be better to not have working memory interfere with it. Because if you're assuming that you can use working memory uh, without, uh, without creating this interference. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so you described the reinforcement learning as costless, but just because it's not, it's not taking like conscious mm -hmm. thought, but not, do, is there any like evidence for this? No, like, Brain functioning is still, it's, still it's a, be costly. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Um, I, I don't have positive evidence for that. Um, there's, there's, there's a number of evidence. There's a number of you know indices that make us think um, um, that that's the case. One of them is that this is a system that's shared across um, across lots of um, lots of species. Um, it, it's very old. And because of that, we think that it's, it's a system that's uh, running in the background that you can't just easily shut off, essentially. Um, and and that's, that's leading us to one of our hypotheses, actually, that this might be a way to actually shut off the system in a way, in a roundabout way, right? Like you're saying, essentially, I've predicted this, don't bother learning it, but it's still learning, right? It's just learning with a prediction error of zero. Um, um, essentially, and, and 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 then the question is, well, why? In which environment can I imagine this being useful to turn off uh, reinforcement learning? Okay, um, so um, the the questions we are, we can ask ourselves is, well, what is the potential benefit of turning off working memory this way, um, in, in this specific way that we found? Um, well, one is that maybe. Um, 
what Kim Array doesn't just contribute to this reward prediction here, but actually contributes to uh, the expectation of value that the uh, RL system has, and that maybe this is beneficial uh, even prior to the learning step. Um, <coughs> that, that might lead to better performance now. Um, I, we've already talked about uh, those costs. Um, so then the question is whether um, reinforcement learning's job, um, since it's its job, its the function it's optimizing is to help in the long run rather than in the short run. Is why why we would be interfering here. Okay, um, so it could totally be, you know, a suboptimal byproduct of evolution. Um, we tend to assume that's probably uh, not the case, just because evolution, because we tend to be proven false when we think that in psychology. <laughs> um, so what we are thinking is that there might be uh, environments that are more realistic in which this is actually helpful. One possible benefit that comes to mind, and I wonder if this fits with the effect you've seen, is that working memory is typically used to perform computation in a deliberative manner yeah. over multiple time steps. So in between seeing images, yeah. users can be thinking yeah. about what they've just seen and yeah. what they saw a little while yeah. back. And so that depends on working memory, yeah. and yet what they think about can also feed, be used by the RL path. Yeah, so you're thinking of, so um, we don't have very strong evidence that, yeah, that's a great great idea. Um, so the idea is that there could be offline RL happening in between trials, right? We actually don't have great evidence that that's happening in humans or even in, in, in animals, but that's something people think about a lot as, as, as something potentially happening, and, and then you would be right, that, that would be a, delay between images in your test? Um, it was uh, uh, of the order of the second. So it was a fairly fast, yeah, yeah, it was a fairly fast-paced uh, experiment. Um, uh, the participants actually perform better if we leave them more time. So we, we do think something like that is probably happening. Um, but um, yeah, that's a good idea. Another, uh, an idea that we think might be happening is that um, Working memory is optimized for learning fast and being flexible, and so potentially the times where you're best at using working memory are in environments that change a lot. Um, in which case, actually having um, reinforcement learning that's inflexible um, learn might actually hurt you because you might be using this and, and having a hard time unlearning when the environment changes. So that that might be a um, a way to adapt um, better. So we're we're trying to test this now. Okay. So we're definitely not going to have time for the second part. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, to to jump to my conclusion. Yeah. <laughs> no, probably not. <laughs> um, okay. So I'm just going to jump to my conclusion. I think. Um, so I've shown you one example of the research in my lab where I'm trying to understand what the computations and what the brain systems are that contribute to reinforcement learning in humans. And really the key point of it is that uh, that it's very important to think of it as multiple systems rather than a simple a single system and that uh, multiple systems um, in interaction um, uh, that, that might provide very interesting dynamics um, in different environments. And um, I've benefited a lot from the research that you guys do. You know, like cognition and neuroscience have um, taken lots of inspiration from um, from AI research over time. Like we've been introducing model-based reinforcement learning and options hierarchical reinforcement learning framework and partially observable Markov decision processes and many other things uh, come directly from um, you know. Uh, NIPs and stuff like that. Um, but I do think there's um, also a potential for reverse um, uh, benefits um, where thinking of, uh, of, of the, the cognition, the behavior, um, might inform potentially better um, AI. So for example, working memory, the other example I didn't talk about was generalization, attention planning, exploration, etc. The way humans do that might um, inform um, uh, better um, algorithms, uh, and also looking at the brain and seeing how uh, 
the brain is implementing those systems might also um, tell us something. So again, I haven't talked to you about that part of my research at all. Uh, but for example, we have this dopaminergic system that we know is implementing something like a reward prediction error uh, that helps us learn those values. Okay? So if we learn more about dopamine and learn of things it is sensitive to um, that we wouldn't expect a priori, that could be a window into knowing what counts as a reward? What is the reward function that matters for learning uh, in humans? So, and people have been doing that. They've seen, like for example, that sub goals uh, have effects on dopamine, or um, that we treat gains and losses differently, um, or that uncertainty has uh, some effects on, on dopamine or novelty, etc. And so that could that are th this pieces of information. I also think that could potentially fit back into um, into algorithms. Okay, and then I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators in my lab and uh, thank you very much for all those great questions. <laughs> And I'm happy to take any more. Yeah. That was a great example you gave at the beginning of the TD learning loop uh, relationship between neural RL yeah. and AI RL. Is there, can you think of something that's the opposite, something that turns up in neural studies yeah. that just doesn't fit very well, or we, we don't have a, a correspondence with AI RL? Um, Yes, I mean I I can think of it more in the behavior than in the than in the, the the brain side of my work, but that that would have been my second part of my talk. Essentially, so the other half of my research is focused on trying to understand how we um, how humans learn uh, more interesting behavior, um, hierarchical behavior, um, and how we um, and how this allows us to. Um, generalize. So an example I like to give is, you know, I've never been in this room before, and despite that, I know perfectly well how to behave in this room, right? It's a conference room. Um, I have a whole set of behaviors that's associated with that that I can reload uh, immediately and make uh, and make use of. And even if it looked very different from any conference room I had seen before, I would know how to do that. So there's something very, um, very high level about this, um, this inference. And so uh, part of my work has been to try to understand how we create uh, this structure um, for learning. And something very interesting that I've been able to show there is that um, it's really a creation process rather than a discovery process. That participants, um, we were talking about that a bit earlier, uh, that, that participants um, search for structure and often find more structure than there is uh, for real and create uh, this structure. And this is a very costly process in behavior. Actually, that's something else I've, sh I've shown that, that it's, it has a cost in how fast we learn and how efficiently we make decisions, etc. cetera. Um, but it comes at a very great benefit uh, down the line of being able, of having cre created representations that are flexible enough that we can generalize them and transfer. Um, um, them. And um, <clears throat> everything I've seen of generalization and transfer in AI has been discovery rather than creation. So I haven't seen, uh, I, again, I might be completely wrong and I'd love to be proven <laughs> wrong actually, uh, but, um, uh, but I haven't seen really um, AIs, you know, doing more work for themselves than they should. Um, like creating more complex representation than they should um, um, in a way, uh, as, as, a, as a way to, uh, um, to, um, uh, to learn better later. And that's something that I've seen not just in, in adults, but I've seen it in um, eight-month-old infants, and other people have seen it in rodents. Um, so it seems like a fairly uh, core, important uh, aspect of learning um, of generalization, and you can think of it also as uh, exploration, because once you have those high level kind of strategies, instead of exploring at a low level, you can explore at a more strategic level and, and uh, uh, in, in a more organized way. In AI, if you normally have a network with larger capacities than required, it tends to overfit a lot. Mm -hmm. so 
I don't know how you can actually encourage exploration and by increasing. I don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know either. That's your job. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, it's. I don't know. It's. I, I've tried to think about it, and it, it feels like it would be really hard. Yeah, um, but it seems like a really important aspect of human behavior. So. So for your work on combining uh, like modeling working memory and reinforcement learning together, mm -hmm. I was just curious, did you do any experiments regarding sequential decision making tasks rather than contextual banning tasks? Or if not, do you have any insights on like how to do this? What kind of changes? Um, yeah, so that's kind of going back to the mall based uh, are you thinking about mall based reinforcement learning? Or it doesn't have to be model based or or uh, model-free RL, all yeah. kinds of yeah. uh, things. Yeah, I haven't done much on, on sequential de decision-making okay. uh, tasks. I'm actually doing one right now that's trying to test the um, the options hierarchical reinforcement learning framework and how, how humans build uh, options, um, and it's very promising. Uh, but that's the only sequential um, learning task I've done. Um, the, the reason I've done that is that... Um, um, Everybody knows about mall based and mall free reinforcement learning, right? Yeah. Um, so it's actually taken the computational cognitive neuroscience community by, you know, as a tsunami, like in the last few years. And, uh, and people have started um, viewing learning as the thing that has to be either mall free or mall based reinforcement learning, uh, directly imported from, you know, Southern Nevada or like, like that. Um, and what I've been trying to show is that it's really much too crude of a, of a distinction. But you see in this kind of tasks, um, there's no sequential um, learning, right? Which means there can't be any planning, uh, forward planning, right? So, which means that mall based and mall free would be doing exactly the same thing in this task. And despite that, we still find those really important dissociations, right? And people studying mall based reinforcement learning in humans have said, well, it, it is dependent on working memory, and it is true it is. Uh, but what, what this shows, I think, is that mall based reinforcement learning is a very big thing that has many cognitive little uh, pieces in it, um, and that it's not this clean dissociation that um, the field has been trying to pretend it is. Um, and so I'm trying to step back and, and be a bit, a, a, a bit cleaner, uh, even in, in simpler tasks. So. Yeah, does that answer your question, Joe? Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, it sounded like what you were saying about humans looking for structure is basically saying that we also overfit when we're trying to learn. Um, it's, like a bit, it's, it's a bit more than that. Than yeah. It's not there. It's a bit more than that. Um, so there's definitely some of that. So there's this really cool experiment that's a, a super simple experiment um, where uh, People just see a stream of ones and zeros. I think it's the black and white dots or something like that. But it's, it's for all intents and purposes, it's a stream of uh, a binary variable randomly picked with probability 0.5. Um, <clears throat> and um, if you just look at their reaction times, um, you see that uh, um, if you have one zero one zero, people will be much. Uh, so what people have to say is press right for uh, one and zero for. For, for life. So it's no learning, no decision, right? Like just press as fast as possible and following what you see on the screen. And what you see if, is, is that if there is local structure in the, in the sequence, even though it's random, so for example, one, zero, and zero, people will be much faster ans answering one than they will be at answering zero after that. Or if there's one, 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 they'll be much faster at answering one after zero. So in that sense, that's exactly overfitting, saying like there's local structure, it's more regular than we think it is. And we are predicting the next one based on this very local structure. That's that's our fitting. I would interpret it this way too. <coughs> um, the type of thing I do um, goes a bit beyond that because um, uh, we're we're essentially creating um, um, variables that don't exist. Um, and that, that are not needed. It's a bit hard to explain without <laughs> having having uh, introduced uh, the question. But it's it's more than overfitting. It's it's creating more structure than there is out there. Um, uh, yeah, it, it, so it would take would take a bit. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So in the case where uh, 
where they were um, pretty like faster when they'd see one zero one zero and things like that. Yeah. Was there any cost? Uh, so in other words, were they slower if it was one zero one zero zero? Yes, yes. Yeah, it goes in both directions, and that's a fairly standard finding. Is that um, is that anywhere you have transfer, you'll have both positive and negative transfer. Mm -hmm. Like you'll benefit if if you're in a situation where you can apply and you'll have a cost um, yeah. otherwise. Yeah. I was going to say if there wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. There's, there's, there's real costs. Uh, it's, um, it's a really important aspect of it. So, uh, there's real costs both immediately and uh, in the long term. Um, yeah. I'm oh, sorry. So, you, if, if you want to end it, we can, I'm happy to go. Okay. No, I, I, I was just thinking, trying to get more on the, more of your thoughts on discovery versus creating. Yeah. A lot of the work I have seen in the AI side of things, at least we focus on sample complexity and like why building these options or these yeah. things could lower sample complexity yeah. over a distribution of tasks. Yeah. I'm curious about your hypothesis for what the actual cost function might be that we are trying to go after. Um, so yeah, there's a, at least three different hypotheses there that I haven't smashed to pull apart yet, um, future work. Um, one is, uh, uh, so, so, so one can be framed in, in, in one of two ways. One is that we just have a prior for that being structure, um, and because we have that prior, uh, until we're proven wrong, we'll just end up being that structure. And that could reflect just the statistics of an environment where we expect it to be beneficial in the long run, in which case you could frame this as a, as a, as a cost function that's, um, uh, the, the ability, uh, minus, I guess, the ability to ungeneralize um, later. Um, another one is um, some kind of divide and conquer um, uh, process where uh, when you build structure, often it um, allows you to make multiple simpler choices rather than one more complex choice. Um, and so that might be a way to um, uh, yeah, to to, uh, to 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 cut the problem in a way that's more tractable. Um, another is um, uh, <coughs> uh, interference, um, a lowering interference. Is that if you uh, create new representations for things that are similar, you might be able to pull those representations apart a bit more, in such a way that will. Uh, make it um, harder for them to uh, interfere when you're learning in slightly different, but uh, in slightly similar, but context, but, but that require fairly kind of similar. I think of this a lot because this is a, a laptop with a French keyboard, um, and I have a laptop that looks nearly the same and has an English keyboard, and the interference between them is horrible. Um, and so, uh, and I think that's because I don't use them equally, but if I did, I would probably be able to very quickly switch from one to the other. <laughs> yeah. So one specific question about this additional structure thing, okay. because I think it's just super fascinating. By the way, your whole talk and research agenda, I think, is terrific. Thank Thanks for coming here to Microsoft. Okay. But um, it strikes me, based upon the explanation that you just gave, the additional structure is a more complicated representation of the state space yeah. in a reinforcement learning problem. State and action space, actually. So the action state, yeah. the action space as well. So could you yeah. give a specific example yeah. about how uh, a human actor might have a more complicated representation of the action space? Would it be like a conditional action space? So yeah. like two, two actions in a row as opposed um, to each uh, action being unique? Yeah. Um, this is not the best slide for that, but I'm going to try to do that. Um, That's okay. um, so, uh, sorry, what's the best? This. Maybe this one. Okay, I always have super simplified <laughs> problems, and 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 I I had a, a a great example with computers and different operating systems before, and I and then I came here and realized there was Linux and and Mac and not Windows in my presentation, so <laughs> I was a bit a bit ashamed of myself. Um, so if you're learning this, uh, if you if you're learning this. Uh, your state space could be um, those six um, images. Mm -hmm. um, and here we have four actions, and you could just learn those six associations. Um, um, okay. uh, what I've been 
uh, working on showing instead is that what people um, are more likely to do. So you, you might recognize here that actually the, the red and gray shapes have the same correct action. Um, is that people will learn, um, um, for example, here in this case, to select a, a rule. TS uh, is short for task set. Um, um, and task set means rule, essentially, or policy, if you want. Um, so that people will learn to select a, a, a rule in response to the color. Mm -hmm. And then when they have selected the rule, they'll uh, use it to um, to select the policy over shapes, um, so, which is this shape uh, action thing. Um, and so in, uh, and so the way you can think of this is um, uh, that essentially uh, what, what I've shown is that essentially you can explain uh, this as people doing RL over two state and action spaces in parallel. So you'll have one loop here that's learning the value of an action in response or a policy for selecting an action in response to a shape. Mm -hmm. um, um, and, and I'm framing this in, in terms of a network in the brain here, but mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't really matter. And another that's operating in a more abstract uh, state and action space, that's this context rule um, uh, 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 state and action space. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and then you, of course, have to create a dependency between them. Um, but, uh, uh, but yeah, so that's that's essentially the same RL computation can happen over the, those two um, state and action spaces in parallel, and that will explain a whole bunch of uh, behavior in terms of how people um, learn. Yeah. And so it seems to me like the right experimental variation in this world would be how human decision makers operate in dynamic systems that are mm -hmm. rapidly changing versus those that aren't. Yeah. Because basically these sort of rules become more costly in those situations. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's going to um, to hit against the... So when you do that, you have to have a way to identify whether people are selecting those task sets or those rules to convince yourself that they are doing that. And that's going to be even harder. <laughs> it's already very hard in non-moving environments. It's going to be even harder in moving environments. So that's the, the problem of studying complex human learning is that you always hit this trade-off where you need more complex <laughs> experiments um, to, uh, to, to to see more interesting behavior. But that that uh, comes with the drawback of of being very hard to infer what participants are uh, are doing. So, but yeah, you're right. Yeah. 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 Let's thank Anne for the questions all the time. Thank you.